our last week with enthusiasm, we were kind of looking, we actually ended, I think, in a really nice place where there are a number of aspects of enthusiasm that are really important. Uh, enthusiasm includes a whole different, you know, it includes our capacity to feel a positive pride or confidence in our practice. Like, yes, I have the enthusiasm of, I actually kind of know what it's like when my narrator is doing this thing and trying to help me out, or I know what it's like to feel my body more relaxed. And that positive pride and confidence is good. Um, there's also the aspect of enthusiasm that includes moderation, not usually what we associate with enthusiasm. And this idea that, yes, we want to have so much momentum towards our own enlightenment, our own waking up to this world and this experience, and if we go non-stop with that, we'll wear ourselves out, we'll burn out. And that's true for both our own practice of opening our heart and mind and our own desire to be of service to others. So we, we kind of closed last week with um, moderation and the importance of really being able to clearly identify when it is ours to be done and when it is ours to be let as it is in a way. So these qualities of enthusiasm are aspiration, firmness, joy, and moderation. And firmness really being the confidence and diligence. Again, not qualities or characteristics most of us are like, yeah, down for that. I actually had a weird dream the other night in which I uh, told a whole room full of practitioners that they weren't disciplined enough. <laughs> and then I had a lot of regret. It's like amazing we have anxiety dreams about <laughs> teaching. I was like, oh, I was too hard on them about discipline. Um, but I do oh. think that as a, what's called a paramita, or a quality that helps us on our meditation path, disciplines, it's about as important as it gets. It, it, we can have all the aspiration in the world. We can feel such joy in our practice, and if we are not disciplined to create the time and space to practice, we are just eternally treading water. And so I will sometimes kind of get a little hard on folks about no, it really, there's no equivalent, there's nothing that you can do that would replace the need to make time for practice, for teaching, and for community. But it's easy to tell you guys that because you're here. Um, so that is helpful. All right, so I'll start here with the stanza. As seasoned fighters face the swords of enemies upon the battle line, Lightly dodge the weapons of defilement and overcome the foe with nimble skill. So one quality of our mindfulness is to be nimble. Nimble as though we were a seasoned fighter facing the sword. And then we can lightly dodge the weapons of defilement. So all of our difficult and disturbing emotions, we're not kind of going to battle head on. We're like, oh, no, thank you. Oh, I'm good. Uh, we're like nimbly moving around those things which are challenging us. In the fray, the soldier drops his sword. In the fright, he swiftly takes it up again. So likewise, in the arm of, if the arm of mindfulness is lost, in fear of hell, be quick to get it back. Hell, again, your more hell realm of your own mental suffering that you experience in excessive ruminative mind wandering. So if in the fray, you drop your sword, you're not like, oh no, I dropped my sword. You're like, oh my god, give me a sword. And the same with mindfulness. If you recognize that you have been living out some sort of ruminative fantasy of what's wrong in the world, which is really easy to do, get back and, oh, nope, here I am. I'm actually sitting on bark. How delightful. Um, <laughs> sorry, inside joke. Uh, in that I think I bring up either bark or bike riding. And or uni. And uni. It's my, my <laughs> ultimate. <laughs> Um, my ultimate uh, challenges of finding, finding mindfulness. So this idea that our, we have to have an urgency. So the qualities of mindfulness that uh, Shantideva is sharing with us here is nimbleness and urgency. Um, and I, I really like that. And the urgency is, well, it's kind of, it's repeated to over and over and over in this text. 
And there's probably a reason. Because the thing is, urgency is really close to us. Like we feel the urgency when things are terrible, right? When we feel lonely, when we feel left out, when all of the news that we are facing on a day-to-day -day basis is terrible. And yet, so quickly we can adapt to things feeling kind of comfortable and okay. And the urgency is like, oh, I'm good, I'll meditate tomorrow. Because there's smoothies right now, or like whatever, right? Whatever's gonna <laughs> occupy us with some hedonic enjoyment. And so how do we continually connect to urgency without becoming a total pain in the butt? <laughs> right? So there's a um, there's an interesting aspect there. So Pema Chodron writes, uh, the quality of, en uh, of enthusiasm, one quality of enthusiasm is urgency. The combination of lightness and urgency is unbeatable. On the one hand, it's critical to your well-being to dismantle the clashes or difficult emotions. On the other hand, if you're too driven, you simply create another form of self-absorption. The trick is to see when you get hooked and then gently but urgently come back to the present moment. Just as a soldier can't be nonchalant about dropping their sword in battle, we can't be complacent about losing our mindfulness. When our mind is distracted, the clashes or difficult emotions move in like a band of robbers. But if we bring our mind back with harshness or panic, we'll never generate the self-compassion we need to progress along the path. So as per usual, Pema Chodron gives us a bit more of a holistic, uh, informed suggestion of how do we work with this urgent mind. It isn't with the austerity and rigidity of like, come on, get it back in there. It's more like, all right, keep coming back. Every time you find your mind wandering, keep coming back. It's firm, it's loving, but it's, it's urgent, right? It has to happen. I don't know about you guys, but I sometimes um, find myself, especially this is uh, scientifically proven when we are tired and stressed, even our best coping strategies are hard to access. And at the end of the day, I find that my resources are quite depleted. Does anyone else feel that way? So, I, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll just kind of think about bad stuff for a while. <laughs> you know, and it's just kind of, I, mean, I don't even know how conscious it is. Um, even if I'm not engaging in social media, it could just really be happening in my own mind. And I, the urgency is like a little, I'm like, well, whatever, I'm going to bed. You can just kind of, let me just not be mindful for a minute here, that'd be nice. And um, it really, <laughs> it's a really great time to refresh your practice. Because of course, that's gonna get into the mind state of sleep and maybe disturb your sleep, possibly wake you up. Um, so how do we really truly keep that urgency of mindfulness, even when we're tired and we're depleted? Um, it doesn't say have to do it, it just says you should do it. <laughs> just for the record. Um, because just as sleeping, seeping venom fills the body, carried on the current of blood, an evil thought that finds its chance will spread and permeate the mind. Nice. Yes, so just like venom. Um, so here we go. As such a man would leap in fright to find a snake coiled in his lap. If sleep and sluggishness beset me, I will instantly dispel them. So, yeah, getting in it. Uh, every time that I fail, I will reprove and vilify myself, thinking long that by whatever means such faults in the future shall no more occur. And this idea, this vilify here, is more like that confession of the chapter two. So if I am there at the end of the evening, kind of ruminating, you know, like, God, that conversation I had my coworker, just feel like it was so off, and she looked at me that way, and, you know, maybe I'll start a rumination of why um, I'll never really figure out how to be comfortable in my job. I don't really feel like I fit in. Everybody else is so this or that or the other, um, to really kind of get clear and say, hey, you're doing, you are falling into that habitual pattern of self-denigration. Mm -hmm. Come back, where are your toes, where are your fingers? Mm -hmm. 
What's it feel like in your body? Mm -hmm. So the idea here is at, right in the moment when we recognize our mindfulness has slipped away, that's when we really kind of get clear and maybe not vilify yourself, but get really specific. What's going on? What's occluding your mind? What's getting in the way of your true nature? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, this is a, a it, it ends on a really nice note, this enthusiasm chapter. At all times and in any situation, mindfulness will be my constant habit. This will be the cause whereby I aim to meet with teachers and fulfill the proper tasks. By all means, then, before I start this work, that I might have the strength sufficient to the task. I'll reflect on these words on mindfulness and lightly rise to what is to be done. The lichen hanging in the trees wafts to and fro, stirred by every breath of wind. Likewise, all I do will be achieved, enlivened by the movements of a joyful heart. It's especially sweet when he says nice things, um, since so much is scare tactic. Um, and Pema then writes, despite the heartbreak of seeing the world suffer, we're joyful that we can do our part to alleviate rather than add to that misery. This happiness gives us access to a tremendous bank of energy that was previously bound up in self-absorption. Now everything that took effort happened spontaneously and naturally. Imagine the upliftedness of a life where everything will be achieved and enlivened by the movements of a joyful heart. I again, last night and this morning, rereading this, was really moved by this idea of despite the heartbreak of seeing the world suffering, we're joyful that we can do our part to alleviate rather than add to that misery. This happiness gives us access to a tremendous bank of energy that was previously bound up in self-absorption. And, you know, that's the whole theme of this entire book. How do we be open-hearted with the endless suffering of this world? Sometimes, which is like maybe one step removed from us, two steps, sometimes which is directly impacting us. How do we keep our heart open amid this? Or how do we even have a sense of joy? And what Shantideva points out here is when we are consumed by our own worries of suffering, it's a form of self-absorption. It's a very compassionate kind of self-absorption. But there's a difference between holding, recognizing, and being with the suffering of the world, not denying it, not pretending it isn't happening, but making some sense of, uh, I am doing my part. I am training my mind and heart so I can remain open for what the world asks of me. And whether we are a kindergarten teacher or a nurse or a uh, baker, right, that we are going through, okay, moving that way with an open heart and mind for whatever is around us. It doesn't tell us exactly what to do. It tells us how to be with the open heart and not lost in that overwhelm of sadness and despair. Um, not that we won't feel sadness and despair, but we, if we hang out there, we are unavailable. We are unavailable for others. So just that is ending our chapter on enthusiasm. Questions or comments on that? Do you guys feel like mindfulness really is a kind of a way to have a joyful heart, like a way to be amid this world? Sometimes, yeah. When I was moving my mother last week, I was mindful that I was being very bitchy. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was mindful of my annoyance, but I couldn't really, I was having a hard time just stopping. But I don't know what it would be like if I didn't have mindfulness. It yeah. It would just be kind of really even worse, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I feel like it's a little bit painful because I feel like I go, and I don't know if it's said it here, but I'm pretty heavy on the attentional and the mindfulness and not so heavy on the compassion. Like, even that last thing you read, like, where we were lost in the... Self-absorption. Yeah, like, I feel like we're not available to other people, but we're actually really not available to ourselves. True. 
Yeah, right, to all parts of ourself. Yeah, it can be really shut down. And that's why, you know, in uh, the contemporary definitions of mindfulness, uh, there's quite a bit of debate, and this is, you know, the modern mindfulness, not this ancient mindfulness. I tend to use that which includes a, a kind presence, not just an aware presence. I think if we are just highly aware, we, we really can run the risk of becoming highly critical as well. And so um, I'm even more aware of the things I'm doing wrong. So how do we bring a kind presence to our noticing and our attentiveness? Yeah, I think that's part of the practice and not like a separate, like, oh yeah, mindfulness with a side of kindness. Um, but I think that's, that's, it's the very nature of the attention and attentiveness can be like, it doesn't have to be overly congratulatory, but at least kind or soft or gentle. Would you consider like being kind to the parts that are not feeling kind? Would that be kind of mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, they serve their purpose, right? They, or at some point, they thought that they were serving a purpose. So that part of us that being, you know, obstinate or, you know, triggered to feeling um, fearful, anxious, lonely, that is a message to us that we need. There, there's, a, there's an important message, right, that we need to pay attention to. <coughs> now getting like hooked and energizing so the hooked as being our shenpa. So the difficult emotions, no problem. Energizing them, that can really create some trouble. Yes. No? Just scratching. Just scratching. Okay. After, so this, now we're doing heartbreak with samsara. Yes. Close, yeah. Please. Of course, is it not open? Uh, there's two more chapters. Yeah. Uh, so heartbreak with samsara. I, I really um, I find this chapter to be enormously useful. You could just teach it all on its own. It really invites us to look closely at that which we think is protecting us and making us safe, and be able, in some ways, to invite that urgency, invite that interest in the practice by just reviewing clearly. What does really make us feel connected, feel safe? Is it truly the outside world? And so samsara is this endless cycle of suffering when we are trying to get that which we believe will make us happy and avoid that which we believe makes us unhappy and which in the process of we're kind of like tramping through the, the flower garden of our own happiness. So in the very first chapter is one of the most famous verses of Shanti Deva is that we heedlessly, in pursuit of our happiness, are destroying right beneath our feet the very roots that could make us happy. Or just anywhere else but here would be an amazing place. And part of that, right, if our mindfulness practice is learning to be with this wildness of the mind, it means that that will also help us hopefully connect to the enjoyment that our own mind can actually us, which uh, we've done in practices here together, to get even a tiny glimpse that your own mind could be a place of refreshment is super rewarding and really reassuring. It doesn't all have to be out there in the outside world. So this first um, stanza is actually very juicy, I think. Uh, After cultivating diligence, set your mind to concentrate. For those whose minds are slack and wandering are caught between the fangs of the afflictions. And this uh, is especially interesting given the kind of growing field of research on mind wandering. Have folks here heard, heard of mind wandering? It's pretty much what your mind's doing all the time. <laughs> so what has been coming out of the research more recently, so there's been these you know, kind of landmark studies now over 15 years ago that our mind is wandering at least 50% of the time no matter what we're doing. More recent studies have looked at, well, what kind of mind wandering? Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Is it neutral? And then also, how much are you rejecting the present moment? 
So if my mind is wandering, do I really not want to be here? Or is my mind kind of just wandering here and there? And some of the research has shown that if we're mind wandering in the past, and especially related to other people, it's more likely that we're unhappy. And if we're mind wandering towards the future, and more about maybe us, though I have a hard time, I'd have to just say, well, this is what the research says. If we're mind wandering to the future and to ourselves, it's more likely to be pleasant. Mm -hmm. And I think that n neither of those things are meditation practices. Huh. What psychology is <laughs> really, really good at is identifying kind of what's wrong. And I think knowing what's wrong is pretty helpful. It's not meditation, right? We don't want to go in and analyze, here I am in my meditation. Am I thinking about the past and other people? Am I unhappy? Right? Then we're doing like self-analysis right in the middle of our practice. However, that knowledge of knowing what our mind, where our mind goes and when it gets into trouble can be quite useful, especially for when we're doing our in-between practices when we're just in the world, when we're on our way somewhere and we are thinking and just notice like, where is my mind right now? Is it in the past? Is it in the future? Is it about me? Is it about others? Is it about the world? And kind of getting a bit more nuanced and granular about our mind wandering. So if we're mind wandering 50% of the time, what are we wandering to? Anybody have an idea? What are the top hits? To-do lists. To-do list, planning. Sort of dreamy fancy, like what I was like. Oh, can you plant the passion fruit tree at the end of the year or just? <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Are they, are they on to their mind wandering content? Ruminating about, Rumin about you know, what happened yesterday or this morning or last week. Or yes, last month, or yes, yeah, euphoric recall. Euphoric? Oh, that's nice. Mm. What? Well, but it doesn't feel necessarily euphoric in the sense of it's long. So the longing. Yeah, it's like euphoric recall and longing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, oh, you guys are lucky. Well, yes, you're lucky. It's going to make you do a practice, or not make you, it's going to invite you, if you wanted to, <laughs> with the right to pass, do a practice of, um, we'll do it, we'll do it next time, though, of, um, I don't know Hmm? Yeah, no, it's gonna come next time. It, we've done this before in um, CEB where essentially you, you're in front of a partner and as you're sitting there, you out loud narrate that which comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's um, you know, it requires a little bit of feeling of comfort and you know, you can lie, you don't have to say everything. But if you feel some level of comfort, they're being witnessed by another person, and then also as the listener, you're like, oh my god, it's not just me, <laughs> right? There's a real feeling of recognizing that, like if I, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try. It's, you know when you put on the spot, your thoughts like flitter away? Um, but if, you're, if I'm just sitting here, I'm definitely thinking of, I have a blister on my foot, my forehead kind of aches, yeah, what's the snack I'm gonna have later? Right, you're just noticing like the mind as it is emitting. And I think it's really useful to, um, again, not all the time, because you would drive yourself crazy, uh, <laughs> but give yourself five minutes or so of just, you can say it out loud or even write it. What is coming to mind? What is it? Because what you'll see, what I invite you to look for is that it is not fresh content. <laughs> you are like rerun central, right? The same stuff over and over and over. And that's part of heartbreak of samsara, right? That is part of like getting nauseated by your, you're like, oh God, come on. God, even focusing on my breath would be better than this. <laughs> <laughs> Because, right, posting our breath, least interesting thing we'd ever want to do. So how do you get excited about it? Well, look at the alternative. <laughs> oh my god, really? Right? And so I think, I think there's ways that um, 
if we can do it kindly, not with a, um, you know, again, the, the very sharp blade could be that of a surgeon or that of someone who's going to cause harm. So we want to have our sharp blade of noticing and really be curious, like, what is this content of my mind? And my guess is you're going to find it's not as compelling as you think it is. And that's good to know. It's good to really know, not take my word for it, to really know. Can I ask a quick science? Of course. Mind wandering question. Yeah. Not too off the topic. Please. So I thought I read a study where there was like some lamentation that weren't around our relationship with our phones because we're not spacing out anymore. Yes. And if there's something really healthy and positive about spacing out that the brain is doing, like actually some of its most creative work. Yeah. That is positive mind wandering. Okay. Imaginative mind wandering, okay. mm -hmm. which unfortunately is like a really small percentage of most of our mind wandering. Okay. And that doesn't mean like um, that we eliminate any spacious open time. It just means to be aware, especially when we're going into that negative rumination. And so if we're in the kind of, you know, positive, imaginative mind wandering, there's we, Unless we're in meditation practice, we don't need to get rid of it. But if we're thinking about overall improving our mental health and well-being, it means we have to get onto ourselves about those negative, looping ruminations. And so our off the our off the cushion practice of again just being in our everyday life includes noticing when we're getting caught in those negative habitual patterns. And then also we can then find the opportunity to savor when we're in these imaginative and beautiful states of creativity, of when like new things arise for us. I mean, it's, um, we don't have to deny or ignore that. We can really kind of even enjoy it more. It's really sweet to um, rediscover creativity. And because I think we're, most of us are so task oriented. Well, and then also with our phone, there's just like no space. There's no space, yeah. There's no not doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's radical to give that kind of, like, you know, I was here, as you guys know, before you came, and I was, like, sitting on a stoop, and I was like, I could do something on my phone. Huh. I could reread again the chapter I reread today twice already, or I could kind of watch people hang out and go by, but do so without comparing them to me as better or worse, or even just watching and receiving. And it was a dull. I mean, admittedly, it's beautiful weather, it's like golden hour, but truly, there's a nice way of giving yourself that space that probably wouldn't have happened um, otherwise. So it's, this is very obvious, but a reminder that that is, does have value. Okay, in solitude, the mind and body are not troubled by distraction. Therefore, leave this worldly life and totally abandon mental wandering. So you heard it here first. Get out of here. Um, this is a suggestion from Shantideva that distractions are far more prevalent in our worldly life. And, and we all know that. And those of us who are fortunate and have the means and capacity to be on retreat, you know that that gives you like an extra kind of um, space for practice. However, I think that um, this idea or this call for solitude doesn't mean we have to actually leave this life. It means that we have to be clear on where we're putting our hopes and aspirations or what we're kind of aspiring to. So um, Shantideva, or sorry, Kamachodra reminds us to consider the type of uh, useless distractions. These are called dunzi. So the distractions that keep us occupied on a day-to-day -day basis and prevent us from really deepening our practice. And then shempa. So that way we get hooked by our difficult emotions, those negative uh, ruminations. And when we have this kind of useless, I mean, it's, he gets so deep into the useless distractions here, and it's, it's kind of heart-wrenching. There is a lot of ways in which we energize and kind of feed thoughts that truly are not doing us or anyone else much good. And especially uh, a little bit later in this chapter when he talks about our over, um, the potential for kind of over investment in how we are, our status with those around us. Mm -hmm. Are we above them? Are we below them? Are we equal to them? And how
how much of our time, I, I love talking, um, as many of you know, about kind of contempt and the difficult side of contempt and judgment and how much of our mental space that occupies. It really, I mean, talk about make us unavailable for empathy and compassion. It really occupies a lot of time and space. Um, so he says next, Shantideva, because of loved ones and desire for gain, disgust with worldly life does not arise. These then are the first things to renounce. Yeah. Such are the reflections of a prudent man. So again, a little bit extreme. Uh, we may not need to develop disgust for loved ones quite yet, but <laughs> uh, what Pema Chodron says is um, that ver this verse addresses a common addiction, seeking happiness in outer things, through a partner, through food, through some possession, as though it could provide the joy that's lacking in our life. Our tendency to be overtaken by these drives is what concerns Shantideva. It isn't the loved one or the want of gain, per se, that need to be renounced. It's the unrealistic hopes we place in these things. We all know that deep side. <laughs> and it's so hard to keep in mind, right? Because sometimes our loved ones do provide us the joy we're seeking. <laughs> and yet, that's not, uh, it's, it's, and that's great. No need to deny that or pretend that we're disgusted every time someone we love makes us feel good, like, oh, stop that. <laughs> but to confuse that with anything reliable and sustainable, to confuse that with the kind of truth given joy of knowing ourselves, that is really tough. But actually, Ben, I was thinking of you reading this, because it brings up a huge paradox here. He is saying, let's develop some kind of healthy disgust for people for the sake of all people. <laughs> right? So let's, let's, let's not get kind of tied up in these worldly, relational tangles so that we can be truly available with love for all people. And that it's not necessarily a contradiction, but there's an inherent tension there, right? So then what is, how are we to be with people? And you like bringing up paradoxes, I thought of you. But yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of something else. I, I'm wondering um, what the state of uh, advertising in mass media was in the days of Shanti Deva. Oh. Because we've got, I, I don't know how unique the challenges of today are, but like there's you know, many billions of dollars invested in uh, keeping us in a very uh, uh, tight sort of form of samsara, let's say. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's that different. I, I read these um, historical accounts of the life of the Buddha, and there was fame and gain and praise and blame, and there was all the vicissitudes. There maybe wasn't so much access to seeing how many other people are both suffering and succeeding, so I think the magnitude might be greater, but I don't know, it's actually a really good anthropological question. If we lived in a smaller community in which we didn't see that much of what was going on in the rest of the world, would we still feel as much striving to be like the greatest person in our community and as much aversion to be like the lowest person? Or is it intensified by how much access we have to others? I don't know. I'd say it would be, again, a good like uh, anthropological question. Of my, my guess is part of our, um, our human condition is this comparison advertising expertly uh, grabs onto it, but it's not, um, it grabs onto something that's already there. And I think it's compounded by some um, feelings of more isolation, right? So many people feel less included in community. And if you look at these, at least in the US, nationwide rates of loneliness, they are absolutely on the rise. So maybe the compounding factors of being shown all these amazing things you are not and told that you should be, and not having the support, connection, and love of community. And I think those those are really compounding factors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, we are almost there. Anyone? Um, I will say that the penetrative insight joined with calm abiding utterly eradicates afflicted states. 
So knowing this, first search for calm abiding, found by those who joyfully renounce the world. So I think this renunciation is a really interesting topic. When I first heard renunciation, my thought was, bless you, this is a kind of austerity I'm totally not about. Life is hard enough. And yet, I have found that this idea more of natural renunciation is meaningful to me. And that natural renunciation is just clearly seeing that which doesn't serve me. Does it serve me to eat really unhealthy food when I'm stressed out? Does it serve me to place all my hope of feeling of safety and security on another person? So then I naturally renounce that which doesn't serve me. Instead of taking it from, oh, well, this Buddhist book told me that I shouldn't do this, and I shouldn't do that, and I shouldn't do the other. I think renunciation should come from our own wisdom of really seeing that which is wholesome and that which is unwholesome for us. So I would, I would encourage us with our heartbreak with samsara to start paying attention to that which is really getting in the way of our sense of deep connection, calm abiding, and a capacity to sit with our own mind. You know, we know that, or some of us know that, there's certain songs we listen to that make us feel agitated, and certain songs we listen to that make us feel calm. And if we want the calm mind, the choice is simple. But can we apply that same kind of discernment to our everyday life activities? So more on heartbreak with samsara soon. Yeah, I'm not, it's interesting. So I, as, as some of you know, um, Chandra Easton, maybe some of you know her, will be returning in September, and we together will uh, kind of take on Wednesday nights. Uh, so we'll definitely make sure to finish this up because we're so close. It's been almost a year now. We're going to finish it. We're going to finish it. We're absolutely going to finish it. And then the last chapter has an additional commentary by Swami the Dalai Lama, which I think is very useful for everyday life. Um, so. I would like us to take a moment to dedicate the merit. And again, for those not as familiar, this is a weird practice. We are essentially saying, all this work we've done together, we've dedicated to all beings. And that isn't some sort of, uh, you know, idea that we have a wish and it will be fulfilled. Like, I want all beings to be free, and by just dedicating it, it will be so. It's more that, can we bring this mindful intention of care to everything we do. And when we're together practicing, there is a belief that what we're doing has greater impact on us and on our relationships and on the people that we're connected to. So we kind of dedicate anything that we have been working on and kind of stewing in here so that it might be a benefit to even more people. So we'll just take a moment and sit in a comfortable, upright position. Come back to a sense of being in and with the body. And consider if any of these phrases of the Bodhisattva vow resonate for you. And if they don't, if there's something that feels authentic about how you would like to be in and of the world. The Bodhisattva vow are, may I be an island for those who need landfall. May I be a lamp for those needing light. For those who are suffering, may I be both medicine and doctor. May I be a bed for those needing rest. This simple vow is suggesting that we meet people as they need us, as opposed to what we think they need. If they need rest, we're a bed. If they need light, we're a lamp. So we dedicate our time here together that all of us may have the capacity to be available to those in need and support those seeking safety, connection, freedom, and peace. May all beings know peace. May all be
beings, no ease. May all beings have a chance of freedom from their difficult emotions. on Friday, not here sadly, but at St. John's Church, if you'd like to come, we'll be teaching on awe and transcendence, you know, just keeping it mellow. <laughs> and as many of you know, this is a volunteer-run center, and it is completely funded on your generosity. So please donate to this wonderful space so that we can all keep coming here together. Bring your friends, tell other people, and if you want to become a volunteer, are we still... I still volunteer sign up list on the desk. And flyers for lots of upcoming events. August, we, there's an upcoming weekend where there's like two different day longs. Mm -hmm. Both really worthy. Um, there's lots, lots, lots. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff on the plane. Did you know oh, yeah. that we put your time into the season? You know, you can say we take your time. When? Uh, the last time we had the flyer. I don't know. What he'll be teaching, yeah. so I shouldn't at this okay. moment say. But there's amazing teachers here from many different backgrounds, so yeah, we can check it out. Thank you all for being here. And a very easy way to give what I do is I always figure.